Welcome everybody. We are really, really grateful as I was telling you for having you all here. We are starting our sessions of Making Visible of 2020 and we are absolutely thrilled and grateful with Valerie Brown. Uh, she's an amazing person that you will, you may know and you will not get, if not, you are gonna know her right now and how amazing she is. And uh, as Annie was telling you, this is our largest group ever. So we may have some issues in the row, but we will try to be and do our best for all of you. And um, I don't know, with that, I think we can have a bell. That's uh, the format. Uh, also, it's important we are following the format of uh, Annie, can you tell something about the format that we are following in the in the tradition of Tignatan? Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, yeah. We're gonna we um, do this webinar. Making visible webinars are all about really bringing to light issues that we might not be as aware of, but we do it in the, um, the tradition of Tignat Han or Zen practice. So we're practicing deep listening uh, and mindful speaking and mindful question asking and um, We'll, I'll get into a little bit with a quote from Thich Nhat Hanh in a minute, but we're going to start today with the sound of a bell, mm -hmm. and um, Adriana will invite the bell, and that'll give us a chance to settle into our bodies, come back to our breathing, and really come to a place where we can deeply listen to what we're going to be hearing tonight and take it in, um, and also just settle, because we've all been probably running around today, and this will give us time to come back to our bodies and our breath. And Adriana is going to offer us the sound of the bell. Thank you so much, Adriana. Um, so Thich Nhat Hanh, if you don't know who that is, is a Vietnamese Buddhist monk, and he is um, has been practicing mindfulness his whole life. And um, I'm going to read you a quote from him um, that is one of his teachings that inspires us to offer these webinars. And this quote comes from an interview that he had with Bell Hooks, who some of you may know, an author and um, academic uh, who writes about love and race. And he answered her question about fear and by saying this, fear is born from ignorance. We think that the other person is trying to take away something from us. But if we look deeply, we see that the desire of the other person is exactly our own desire to have peace, to be able to have a chance to live. So if you realize that the other person is a human being too, and you have exactly the same kind of spiritual path, and then the two can become good practitioners. The only answer to fear is more understanding. And there is no understanding if there's no effort to look more deeply, to see what is there in our heart, and in the heart of the other person. The Buddha always reminds us that our afflictions, including our fear and our desiring, are born from ignorance. That is why in order to dissipate fear, we have to remove wrong perceptions. And we might think of this whole project of making visible that we've been doing as a way to remove wrong perceptions. So uh, we wanna offer some direct perceptions that we can hear from teachers um, and people who are doing work on the front lines of social justice. And, and we, yeah, sorry, ahead. sorry, uh, and the purpose of this, we are also, Annie and myself, we are learning with you at the same time. We are not like giving any other than our time to be with you and to learn at the same time with you from people who are part of this group. Um, and that's it. 
Yes, thank you for that reminder. We're just students too. Mm -hmm. So we're very excited to be hosting Valerie Brown on this webinar. She'll be leading us and I'm just gonna give you a short introduction to her that she shared with us. Um, Valerie has been leading retreats in uh, Washington DC area for us for several years. Um, and she is a Dharma teacher in the Thich Nhat Hanh tradition. And her deepest passion is creating, designing, and facilitating spaces for all people that foster openness, authenticity, and trust. She transformed her life and work as a high-stress, high-pressure pressure lawyer lobbyist to, to human-scale work to foster greater courage, compassion, and love in action. As I said, she's an ordained Dharma teacher in the Plum Village tradition. She was ordained by Zen master Thich Nhat Hanh. She's a co-director of Georgetown's Institute for Transformational Leadership. She's a chief mindfulness officer of Lead Smart Coaching, where she works with leaders and teams to cultivate greater well-being, self-awareness, and mindful leadership. She's a member of the Religious Society of, of Friends, the Quakers. She's a teacher and a student of Kundalini Yoga. And she helps leaders to discover the wisdom of the body. And she leads an annual pilgrimage to, uh, on the Camino de Santiago in Spain to celebrate the power of place. Valerie is of Afro-Cuban descent and identifies as black and was born and raised in the People's Republic of Brooklyn. <laughs> and um, if you'd like, I don't know whether people are on gallery view or speaker view, but I would, if you could please click on speaker view at the top of your screen, if you are not already on speaker view, and I'll invite Valerie to um, begin her sharing. Thank you, Val. So dear Thai, uh, Thich Nhat Hanh, um, dear beloved community, uh, I'd like us to begin by maybe just taking a look across our screen and see who is, who's here joining us. Maybe uh, we've switched to another mode, if it's possible to just kind of see who's here. I'm, I'm actually in gallery mode, so, and just taking in everyone's face. And it feels very nourishing. So I'm gonna switch to another page and just see who's here. So welcome. I'd like to also thank uh, the organizers, Annie and Adriana, and all the people who have contributed to this webinar. It takes many hands. So I hope that you can hear me and the, the quality of my, the sound of my voice is okay. So I want to begin with a moment of transparency. Even as I speak these words, my beloved brother is in St. Luke's Hospital, connected to uh, an oxygen tank, and uh, he is approaching the end of his life. And he's, he's breathing with the help of, of uh, oxygen. And so even as I take this breath in and I take this breath out, I am very aware of this privilege, this great privilege I have of being able to breathe. And so even as I say these words, I can feel right here in my heart a, a, a kind of hole already. And, and my eyes feel you know, very teary. And so this is what you have at this moment. Uh, and I, I want to share that, um, recognizing that I'm not alone, that there are many other people who have, who may be on this call right this minute, who are experiencing great suffering. And so we are united in our humanness 
and in our, uh, in our suffering as well as in our joy. And I'm very grateful that you are there. So I'd like to begin in, uh, in a kind of Quakerly way by, uh, with a, by welcoming all of the various parts and complexities of who we are. This is, um, this is what we call the inclusive welcome. Again, a way of, of recognizing what we, what we bring. So I'd like to welcome people of all gender identities, all gender expressions, all sexual orientations, people of all races, all cultures, all ethnic backgrounds, whatever your economic status is, whatever your immigration status is, whatever your marital status is, that is welcome in this space. For those people who come with a very deep understanding of anti-Black racism, and those people who are brand new to this topic or, or wanting to learn, thank you for, for being here and spending your time. So for people who are skilled and aware of the Plum Village tradition or other faith traditions or no faith tradition at all, thank you for being here. To the language is spoken in this, in this community that's gathered, welcome. Whatever your age and stage and degree of relationships, those of us who are mothers and aunts and fathers and brothers, Thank you. Wherever you are from, that place holds a very special place for me in my heart right now. Welcome to the place that you are from. To the, our dreams and hopes and aspirations for these next 90 minutes or so and to our bodies, you know, sometimes I feel like I, I live with, you know, from the neck up, cut off from the wisdom, the great wisdom of, of the body. So welcome to our bodies. And how about we welcome the elders, the elders on this webinar, the elders in our life, the teachers, the ancestors, the descendants, all of them. And of course, the spirit of the native people, wherever you, you may be situated, the people who have inhabited the land on which you are right at this moment. I want to shout out for the Lenny Lenape people. Uh, they, had, uh, they have a, a lake just down the hill from where I am. And there are many stories about the people who lived on this land and so, Welcome to the spirit of the native people. So, so much is said and I could keep going, but I won't. But is there anything else or anyone else that you believe should be welcomed? I'd ask the organizers to just unmute folks so that they could speak that. Anything else or anyone else? They and feel I should be welcome. And I would like to offer if you want to raise your hand, then you click on um, participants at the bottom of your screen and you'll see an option to raise your hand in that window. So welcome to us all. Thank you for being here. So the roadmap for this webinar. Um, as you can see, at least I'm trying to st we're starting out in a very interactive, co-creative way. Um, and we'll begin with intention. So I'll be turning back to you and to the power of intention to direct how how we think about anti-Black racism. 
we'll, we'll look at a set of community agreements because we will have some time in small groups and in this large group. And then I'll share with you some of my thoughts around uh, this topic. And we'll close with a beautiful self-compassion exercise uh, from the book Mindful of Race by Ruth King. So that's kind of the lay of the land. So can I get a kind of thumbs up maybe, or a thumbs down or a thumbs sideways or a something or another? <laughs> okay, all right, I'm seeing, I'm seeing quite a bit of thumbs up, good. Okay, so intention, yes, intention. So uh, intention, I really like to begin here because I really do believe that intention kind of drives, it directs our action. And intention can feel very slippery. You know, first it's this, then it's that, um, or it's something else. Or you could be very clear about an intention that you are holding. But wherever you are on that continuum, this feels very unclear or my intention feels very clear, the effort to name and to claim an intention is very powerful. So I'd like us to consider an intention that we might be holding, you might be holding for this particular webinar. In what, what would be meaningful for you? What brought you here? Um, what are you hoping to have happen for yourself and maybe for this community that's gathered around you? So in a moment, uh, the organizers will, will be getting us into breakout groups of triads, groups of three. And when you're in your groups of three, you'll have an opportunity to talk for about two minutes, a minute, two minutes, something like that, about your intention, what would be helpful, what would be meaningful, what brought you here uh, at this particular webinar. So when you get into your breakout group with two other people, uh, I'd like you to do a couple of things. The first is to introduce yourself to everyone, to say your name. And then the second is to appoint a timekeeper so that you know, the time is equally divided and that anyone who wishes to speak has an opportunity to do so. And so uh, this is gonna be pretty short. This is kind of like speed dating. It's not your whole life story. It's not like I was born in Hoboken and then we moved to Jersey City and then this happened and that happened. This is, you know, this is pretty, uh, this is pretty succinct. So it's really about that. What brought you here? What would be meaningful for you? Um, like that. And I think the organizers will put the instructions that I just gave in the chat box so that we won't forget that. So in a moment, you'll be headed off into your breakout rooms. But let's just take um, just maybe 30 seconds to pause and to breathe. I'll be inviting us throughout this webinar to do just that. So just take a few breaths, coming back, maybe feeling our feet on the ground if you're seated, maybe your back against the chair. So I'd invite the organizers to head us into the breakout rooms. Great. Valerie, would you like us to put up the agreements before we go into that room, those rooms, or is that? Uh, we'll do that. We'll do that later. Okay. That's okay. coming. Great. Yeah. Okay. So Adriana, did you want to tell people what they're going to see and then we'll put them in their rooms? Yes, sure. Uh, so you're going to have, sorry, let me look at them. But um, first, uh, you're uh, going to receive uh, an invitation. You have to accept the invite. You will see a window, window with a blue button that says, join breakout room. Click on this button, and you will automatically be in your breakout room. 
Second, chatting while in a uh, breakout room. You will see these steps in your breakout room. Chatting while in your breakout room will only be seen by those in your room. If you need help, have questions for us while you are in the breakout room, click ask for help at the bottom right half of your Zoom window. Look for the little question mark. When breakout session are over you will see a one minute notice if you do nothing you will automatically come back to the main room after one minute or to come back before that click leave breakout room in the lower right corner we also have that here and we can send the instructions later to the the whole groups the prompts the instructions that valerie just gave us and, and and these instructions too. Thank you so much, you. Um, Adriana. Valerie, um, how much time do people have? Oh, right. Mm -hmm. You need to know that. Um, so let's, let's do like two minutes per person. Two minutes per person. Okay. Not long. Great. And then come okay. on back. Okay. Okay. And we're going to create the breakout Enjoy. rooms. Enjoy your breakout rooms. All right, so now that we're back, I think we are all back, hopefully. Um, I would invite maybe three or four people who would like to share uh, just a tiny bit about an intention, what brought you here, what might be meaningful for you. I, I'll also say that I recognize that this is a large group and that there are people of all different backgrounds who are participating in this. So with that, anything that you'd like to say, three or four people. And do you want people to raise their hands? Yes, okay. please raise your hand if you'd like to speak and the host will unmute you. So that means opening up the participant window and raising your hand. So far, I don't see any hands. I'm waiting. Oh, okay. Susan. Oh, you see one? Yes, yeah, Susan is raising her, physically her hand. So. Oh, I was gonna say I have one. Okay, and I also have one whose hand is raised on the computer now. So. Okay, so maybe, why don't you unmute Susan? Is that Suzanne Garofalo? Yes. Okay. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, yes perfectly well, thank oh, you. Good, good. So my name is Susan Garofalo. I just joined. I was held up in traffic. There was an accident on the highway on my way home. So I apologize for being so late, um, but I'm very excited to be here tonight. I've really been looking forward to it. And um, my intention, I, I don't really know too much or what to expect um, with, this, with this process, but um, my intention is to um raise my awareness and see if there are you know having grown up uh in a white neighborhood a uh, white family having white skin i'm i'm sure that there are things uh that i'm not aware of in my behavior and my thinking and i just want to be um enlightened and um proceed forward with um the best behavior, best speech, best awareness, best best me. So that's my intention. I also I work in a in an office with uh, seven people. I'm the only white person in the office. Everyone else is African American. Um, I uh, and as a child, as a as a very small child, I marched with Martin Luther King. Civil rights um, and social action was a big part of growing up in my in my household. So. Um, I just want to learn as much as I can. I'm very grateful to be with you tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. And we have several people have raised their hand. Would you like me to go ahead and unmute Valerie? Please. Okay, so Linda Clapton, I'm gonna unmute you. Hi, I'm in Spasville, California, member of Asanga, working towards order of inner being. And I've been working with these questions for the last couple of years through a foundation I'm part of that gives scholarships to college students. And 
over the last few years, it's gone from maybe 20% people of color receiving scholarships to almost like 50 to 75% of the people re uh, in that organization. And Angela Parks has been working with us and I did some work recently with Holistic Resistance, which is an amazing group of uh, two African-American people and two white people singing and doing uh, a lot of white, working with a lot of white people. And so I was really excited to see something in Thich Nhat Hanh's organization around these issues because it's one I've been diving into and I'm meeting with a group weekly and there's another couple of people on here, hopefully that are part of that group. So thank you so much for offering this. I'm looking forward to learning and growing more. Thank you, Linda. Uh, do we have someone who identifies as black indigenous or a person of color who might be interested in sharing an intention? Uh, okay, we have three people's hands up. Steve Heller, Nancy Edmondson, and Rose Mina. I don't know how they identify. Okay, let's, uh, so we, let's hear from uh, two or three of those people. Sure, sure, go we'll forward. go with, mm -hmm. okay, so Steve, we're gonna unmute you, Steve Heller. Thanks. Sorry, Val, I don't, <laughs> I don't meet the criteria you offered. Mm -hmm. uh, pretty white. Um, I, I just wanted to, to offer one of the intentions that I shared with the others in my breakout session, and that's a curiosity about getting clarity on the distinction that I uh, assume you're pointing to with the title of, of tonight's uh, workshop. Uh, and that is um, why it is specifically labeled as anti-black racism. Yes. And I'm guessing there's a distinction that I'm missing. So I have an intention about gaining clarity on that question. Thank you, Steve. It's good to see you. Likewise, thanks. Um, okay. Um, next, we're going to ask to hear from Rosemina. I'm going to unmute you. Rosemina? Hi there. Uh, my name is Rosemina Munji. I am uh, happy to be here and I'm appreciative, Valerie, and, and uh, everyone who's helping to organize uh, for this session today. Um, I am uh, of South Asian descent, uh, identify as a person of color, um, originally from South Africa, and having moved around to various countries, uh, ended up in Canada. I live in Toronto now. Um, I've been practicing off and on with the uh, uh, Thais community um, for many years and also been fortunate enough to go on retreat with with Ty and, and uh, his community. Um, I'm a mindfulness teacher and so, and also a master's student um, and a psychotherapist. Uh, so my interest in this topic uh, is um, so that I can be of better service and to show up um, in, a, in an inclusive way that promotes uh, belonging, a sense of belonging, community, um, taking into account um, ethics and values and, and uh, the diverse populations that I work with, um, all kinds of diversity actually. So I'm really interested to, to hear more and to learn more, uh, to be open to what's shared today. Thank you. Thank you. Rosmina, much appreciated. So maybe we have time for one more. I know Dave Sampe, I believe is here and I'm gonna, Unmute. I unmuted Bea's line. Okay. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hi. Hello, Dave. Hi. Hello. I'm David Sampe. Um, I, I, my attention here is to more, more or less just continue to bridge the gap um, between us. And what I mean by us is I mean that, you know, people of all race, color, gender, and, uh, and any of my experiences. Um, that I can share, any stories that I can share to help that, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very much willing, will, willing to give. Uh, you know, I, 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 I do always say, you know, 
when whenever I'm speaking because I I, I am also a, a mindfulness teacher and coach and 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 and, and do a lot of work with uh, people in my community and for folks outside of our community it, it's important to understand the trials and the tribulations that we go through as just being a black man in America to understand that there is never a second in the day uh, that I'm not aware that I'm living in this black skin. And the, the, the toll that that can take on the psyche of a community, um, there's layers to this onion that, uh, that we really need to dig down because this is not something that is just, uh, that, that is, you know, uh, um, the civil rights, uh, uh, um, what is it called, um, affirmative action. And all of these laws and things that have changed hasn't changed the way that we have to live in our skin and become and always be aware of our blackness. And I, and I think that bridging the gap here today starts that conversation um, to where we can, st you can understand us and vice versa, and we can start a healing process. And I think that that's, uh, that's what I'd like to be able to bring forth today. Thank you for having me. I, I'm very appreciative to be here. Dave, thank you thank for you, being Dave. here. Yeah. yeah. So I'd like to invite us to pause and breathe again, to take in what we have heard just so far of what brings us here and maybe holding our own intentions um, with a kind of quality of, uh, of lightness and awareness. So um, I want to say, kind of echoing both Annie and Adriana's point, that I'm, I'm not coming from an expert place. Um, I'm a person just like you, trying to figure this out. Um, I value collaboration over perfection. And so this might be a kind of messy, a little bit of a, of a discussion that we're going to be having here. But also say, I also want to say that I'm doing my own work. And I'm about supporting other people who are interested in doing work on anti-Black racism. So I'm really walking right alongside of you. I'm on the path of healing and engagement. Um, and my deepest prayer, my deepest hope is that at the end of this time together, that we'll have a, a, maybe a, a, a sense of our own connectedness to our body and maybe connectedness to each other. So what this webinar, as you can see, is not, it's not going to be didactic or dialectical. I'm not going to slap up charts and graphs um, and get into anything like that. Um, this really is a time of engaging in relational mindfulness. So this will be a, a time for us to speak and listen to each other, um, to pause and to breathe. And of course, healing from racial uh, trauma, racial inequities, as Dave has said, is, is iterative, right? This is nonlinear. And, uh, and so we'd like at, at the end of this webinar, at some point going forward, you'll receive a list of resources on how you might continue to explore this topic. So I'm a volunteer gardener, um, which means that I really, I've got a thing for roots. I like to know where things come from. And so I wanna begin with the roots, and that is by acknowledging that the roots of what I'm going to be sharing with you in terms of the mindfulness practices come from the Plum Village tradition and from Zen master Thich Nhat Hanh. 
And so whenever I speak about other people and their culture, I want to begin with a sense of cultural humility. There's a lot that I don't know. I also want to acknowledge uh, the, the power and the presence of Thich Nhat Hanh, not only in my life, but in the lives of many, many other people. So in speaking today, I will be offering my own personal story about racism and anti-Black racism and mindfulness as a path for healing. And of course, from the Buddhist perspective, when I speak about self, I'm also speaking about non-self elements. So there is the historical self, which is I was born at this time, I was raised in this place, I went to this school. There are historical details of my own particular life. That is the historical dimension of self. But there's another dimension of self, and that is the ultimate dimension of self. That is where there is no birth, there's no death, there's no beginning, there's no ending, there's no up, and there's no down. And so I will be speaking both from the historical and the ultimate dimension of self. So from the historical dimension of self, yes, I'm of Afro-Cuban descent. I identify as cisgendered and heterosexual, the, time of the, the child of, of immigrants. And I know that many, many people um, are also hold that status, immigrant status. Um, I am, grew up in poverty, but through the love and support of many, many people, made my way out of poverty in Brooklyn to a more middle-class lifestyle. And, uh, and I followed a very traditional path of being a lawyer and a lobbyist. I went to Howard Law School at the time of the great civil rights leaders, people like Mrs. Rosa Parks and Justice Thurgood Marshall were frequent visitors of the school, James Baldwin and so forth. And so it was a very special time. I went to law school, became a lawyer to escape out of poverty and, um, and had, was quite, quite internalized with, with a deep sense of um, um, less than, I guess you would call it that. It was actually a, what many people would now call a white supremacist mindset. So deeply embedded with a sense of perfectionism, time urgency, get it done yesterday, a deep, deep defensiveness, and much more. At that time, I also was deeply embedded in an assimilationist mindset. All I wanted to do was to fit in. And the fitting in was, of course, to be safe, to be bodily safe. So I straightened my hair and wore acceptable clothing. Um, and very, very early on, 25 years ago, 1995, I attended a lecture, a talk, actually, a public talk given by um, Thich Nhat Hanh at the Riverside Church. And so I showed up at this church unaware that I was suffering from racial, ancestral, and child childhood trauma. I was really quite embedded in a fight, flight, appease, or freeze mode. So I was, I, was, I was just stuck, frozen, in either frozen or fighting. And very, very little, very few relationships, very much cut off from my body, very much unable to relate to other people. And I have the greatest gratitude for the Plum Village community and for, for Thai Thich Nhat Hanh for helping me. And I am again still on this path of trying to figure this out, to build relationships, to come into a deeper relationship with my own body. 
So that is how I come to this. Um, as I mentioned, I deeply value collaboration and creating a safe space. And so I want us to, be, to begin again with a kind of set of community agreements, a way that we might engage each other because we'll be going into another breakout session. And so Annie or Andriana, if you could place on the screen, share your screen, the set of community agreements and maybe each one of us could, could take one of these community agreements and read them out loud. But I'd like to acknowledge where these agreements come from. This is the work of Glenn Singleton and Curtis Linton in their book, Courageous Conversations About Race. And this also is the work of, of Angelis Arian, who is a cultural anthropologist from the Basque region of Spain. And this is also the work of uh, the Krishnamurti Foundation. So I'll read the first, uh, the first agreement and then Adriana and Annie, if you could read the others. And then just to just kind of, do we have a thumbs up? Is this the way we want to proceed? Is there anything missing? So kind of large group discussion about this. So the first, uh, the first agreement, stay engaged, be present as fully as possible. Staying engaged means remaining morally, emotionally, intellectually, and socially involved in the dialogue. Listen for connection instead of disagreement. Listen instead of preparing a rebuttal. Ask for clarification instead of opposing others. Number two, experience discomfort. Be mindful of your reactions. Notice when you feel comfortable or uncomfortable. Discomfort is inevitable, especially in dialogues on issues that evoke strong emotions. Commit to bringing these dialogues into the open. Divisiveness and polarization already exists in society at large, and not talking about these issues may encourage greater tension. Number three. Speak your truth. Notice what has hurt and meaning for you. Be open to saying not just what you think others want to hear. Speak without making other people wrong through blame or judgment. Speak in a way that is truthful, kind, useful, and unifying. Accept and accept, expect and accept non-closure. Okay, hang out in uncertainty and avoid rushing to quick solutions when you feel tension. An equity of voice. Hold equity of voice as a personal aspiration and create to create a welcoming and supportive learning community. Thank you. I think these agreements will also be in the chat box for your reference. I would add two additional agreements. Again, these are guidelines for how we might engage each other because this is a large and diverse group and we'll be engaging in relational mindfulness, speaking and listening. I would add confidentiality as an obvious and necessary guideline for creating safe space, brave space, and self-care and self-love. So to do what is resourcing for you what is supportive for you. So um, with that, I'd like to give you, let's say 30 seconds of think time to reflect on these community agreements that we're offering. So we'll be, you'll, we'll just be in silence for about 30 seconds. And then anything you want to say, again, raise your hand, indicate that to the host, and they will unmute you and you can speak. We'll hear from a couple of people and then we'll decide, does this work? Okay, 
Um, so clearly we could spend this entire webinar coming up with a set of community agreements. And what we've offered is not uh, the end all and be all. There's much more that could be added here. Um, but what's missing? What should be here that isn't here that would help to create an inviting space for you? Please. We have someone who wishes to speak. If you just, the host can unmute. No one has raised their hand so far, but we did have one question in the chat room or in the chat that was about, um, ah, hang on. They ask, what is the um, purpose of our discussions? Yeah, so we will be we'll we'll be talking about this topic of anti-black racism. Is that useful to to the person who asked the question? Um, I don't know. I'm not seeing there. Um, this is Marion. I asked the question. Um, that's pretty broad, but okay. Great. Thank you. Okay, wait, someone's raising their hand. Hold on a second. Ah, okay. Sharanki. Okay, Sharanki is. Mm -hmm. Can you unmute? Hi. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just had one question, Valerie. When I think about these conversations, the word that always comes up for me about how the the space I want to create and I want to step into that others create is grace. And can you tell me where that would fit in in any of these? I mean, it might be something different and I'm not suggesting adding it, but I'm just curious how and where you see grace here. Mm. Yeah, so um, thank you, Sharon. I appreciate the question. You're welcome. Yeah, so my sense is um, we have a large and diverse group of people with lots of different ideas. And uh, when I think about grace in this context, I'm thinking about spaciousness and flexibility and a willingness to, um, a willingness to, to experience maybe discomfort. You know, that, and, um, and a willingness to, um, be open to others' ideas. Mm. Right. Thank you. So that's my sense. Okay. We have one other person. Oh, sorry. We have someone else who's raising their physical hand that I did not see. Yes. So um, let me unmute. Um, where is Mo it? Moshian. 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 Okay. Mm -hmm. Unmuted. Yora people, Michael, New Zealand. Um, I'd like us to consider adding a foundation statement pertaining to what Valerie called roots, just to identify where we come from. Uh, and that gives us a context for othering and belonging, um, because we all come as we talk and interact, we all come from this place. Um, thank you. Thank you. So if I understand the, the speaker of uh, some kind of a foundational statement that sets a context. In your example, Valerie, you talked about um, uh, sexual identity, sociological, just a brief um, to make explicit who we are because it shapes yeah. our conversations. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. This is how we began by looking at inviting in the various identities and complexities that are on this webinar, right, of gender and class and socioeconomic and all of that. This is how we began, because this is so important. Um, 
it was unless there's something else. There's one there's more one. hand up. Would you like to hear? This is Jim Quay. I'm going to unmute. Please. Jim, yeah. Jim Quay? Yeah, no, it's gone now, I okay. guess. Okay. Jim, you're unmuted. Did you want to say something? Yes, I'm sorry. I thought I, I was on. Um, I wanted to ask Valerie if she might say something more about equity of voice. It's mm. not, a, not a phrase I'm familiar with. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so just kind of what it means that all voices are welcome and that we, we value whatever it is you would like to say, but know that you don't need to speak verbally that obviously most of the way we communicate is nonverbal. And so whether the person is speaking verbally or not, we're always communicating, but we wanna make sure that if you would like to speak verbally, that you have an opportunity to do that. And then we have an opportunity to listen deeply to whatever it is you have to say. And so uh, sometimes in groups, we lose track of time and one person may go on for quite some time and, and then others don't have an opportunity to share. And so we want to make sure that um, everyone who wishes to share has a chance to share. Is that useful, Jim? Yes, thank you. Okay, great. So um, with that, can we kind of get a thumbs up, a thumbs down or a thumbs sideways? Would this be okay to kind of start the process rolling a little bit? Seeing a lot of thumbs up. <laughs> Woo, okay, thank God. All right, thank you. All right, so um, we're heading into, uh, we're heading into a little bit of a time to pause and practice before we go take another step on this topic of anti-Black racism. And um, I'd like to offer a guided meditation. This is from a transgendered somatic activist by the name of Sage Hayes. So we are connected by our ancestors and we are connected by our descendants. One of the defining experiences for me as a black person, and I understand for many people, black people and people of color, um, indigenous people, is a sense of isolation that we are alienated. Um, and this guided meditation is to suggest that we are not alone, that we have an ancestral arc of people who have wisdom, and resilience that we can connect with at all times. They are both ancestors, people in our past, and they are descendants. So this will take just a couple of minutes. So I'd invite you to, to get yourself in a comfortable place. <clears throat> if laying down is supportive, lay down. If standing is supportive, stand up. Do whatever is resourcing for you. You have our permission. Maybe take a few breaths. And just scan your body and just notice how you're feeling right now. Maybe feeling your feet on the floor. And take a, take a moment to look around the space that you are in and notice what is there and allow your eyes perhaps to fall onto something that feels pleasant. Just allowing your eyes to take in something that feels pleasant. And just notice that and notice what that sensation of pleasant feels like. the sensation of pleasant. 
And if nothing comes up, that's totally fine. You know, you may have some very strong emotions. Maybe you're very tired and that could be totally, totally reasonable. So if it's supportive for you, um, connect with your breath again and allow your mind to wander back maybe five years from now, five years, 10 years, 50 years, 100 years, and bring to mind an ancestor. It could be one person, it could be a group of people, maybe it's an animal, but some person or person that supported you. And see that person clearly. Because of this person, you get to be here. You get to live in this body. You get to move about your day with great freedom. Taking in the wisdom of this, this ancestor. And feeling in your heart and mind how much they have given and how much you've received. And if it feels appropriate, saying thank you. And coming back to the sensation of your own breathing, feeling the in-breath, feeling the out-breath. And feeling the sense of gratitude to this person in your life. And when it feels complete, releasing that. And now bring your mind forward in time, five years, 10 years, 50 years, a hundred years to a descendant, some one who gets to be here because of the choices that you made in your life. This could be a group of people, it could be an animal, but because of your generosity, your goodness, your kindness, this person is able to live. They flourish and they say thank you to you and you take that in, you feel that. And breathing with that sense of, I've done something good. The happiness that that feels. Allow yourself to breathe with that. And when this feels complete, saying goodbye to this descendant. Coming back to the sensation of your feet on the floor. Maybe you're back against the chair. Take another look around the room, the space you're in connect with that object 
that was a source of something pleasant, a sensation of this is pleasant. It could be a feeling, maybe it's the feeling of your feet as they touch the floor or the clothes against your skin, but the sensation of this is pleasant. And when you're ready, taking a few breaths and opening your eyes, stretching in any way that feels comfortable for you. So thank you. So I'd like now to shift to uh, the context for this session. So racism um, has been called a disease of the heart by Ruth King. John Powell calls racism a social construct. Abraham Kendi calls racism a power construct. Whatever way we call it, racism manifests on a personal, interpersonal, intrapersonal, structural, and systemic level. So why anti-Black? You know, why not anti-something else? So the answer to why anti-Black is this. The first is that this webinar is to celebrate Black History Month. And so I'll share with you the words of Carter G. Woodson, who was the founder of Black History Month. He said, appreciating history is a prerequisite to equality. Appreciating history is a prerequisite to equality. So I want to acknowledge um, that discrimination and suffering happens on many levels, not just racial. And this is not about pitting one group against another group. And that suffering on one level is the same for all humans and, of course, quite individual. As humans, as human beings, we are, we are connected in our suffering. And this is also not to minimize the suffering of specific racial, ethnic, and cultural groups, but anti-Blackness is quite specific. And this is what I mean. Anti-Blackness begins with an understanding of the roots of slavery, colonialization, and the enslavement, and brutalization of Black people. And by Black, I mean people of African descent, people from the continent of Africa or the uh, diaspora, the African diaspora. So within the United States, and what I'm saying, offering is in the context of the United States, um, there is a long history of institutionalized racism, legalized racism, legalized through statute, legalized through case law, legalized through custom that created structural barriers to equality that affect every black body. This affects black bodies in terms of access to housing, education, voting, economic, in every corner of society. There is disparate treatment of blacks and that continues to this day. Of course, we had legalized segregation in every aspect of public accommodation, including hospitals, transportation, schools, and so forth. So we know that um, in education, um, that there is a large achievement gap between Blacks and non-Blacks, whites in particular. In healthcare, we know that African-Americans in particular have disproportionately higher rates 
of adverse health conditions, including cardiovascular disease, obesity, adverse birth outcomes, and untreated and mistreated psychological conditions. Violence. We know that African-American males, particular, from ages 15 to 34, comprise only 2%, about 2% of the population in the United States, but are more than 15% of, uh, of those subject to deadly force by police officers. We are aware of the link between poverty and food availability. I mean, nourishing food availability. This structural, these structural barriers, systemic barriers embedded in the legal system of the United States have brought, around, brought about a wealth gap, and so which affects home ownership. And so we know that racial, pro, racial oppression, particularly um, for Blacks, is a form of racial trauma. And um, this manifests in a devaluing specifically of Black bodies. So the contemporary form of this racism takes the form of implicit bias which are a set of unconscious assumptions, which are rooted in racial superiority or racial inferiority. And we know from the work of Robin DiAngelo that white children develop a sense of racial superiority as early as preschool. And this is obviously not surprising because of the constant messages that we receive in our society. So I've said a lot there, and some, some of this might be quite obvious or not. So let's just pause and take in that for just a moment. If you'd like to take a drink of water or maybe stretch to resource yourself, um, but to take in the magnitude of what I've just shared with you. So what is the role of mindfulness in this suffering? Anti-Black racism, anti-Black discrimination is a form of suffering. And the purpose of mindfulness is to alleviate suffering. Mindfulness is a path of practice. And just for clarification, when I speak of mindfulness, I'm speaking of three specific elements. The first element is focused attention. This is a, what we call puppy training. It's, it's focusing and concentrating, bringing one's awareness back to the present. The second is a quality of open monitoring. That is a receptive and non-judgmental awareness, so-called spaciousness, what, Sus what Sharon referred to as a kind of grace, you know, that energy. And the third is ethical that the underpinning of mindfulness is socially engaged for pro-social good, for the good of society. So how does mindfulness help with this healing? Um, so I'd like to speak first for, 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 for Black, Indigenous, and people of color, and specifically when I say the word Black, I'm meaning black, black, indigenous, I'm also a person of color. My experience is that for us as, as, and for myself as a black person, that healing from racial trauma requires a special, is a special kind of healing that requires long-term and sustained healing. 
And so I want to lift up the work of Dr. Sean Ginwright, um, who has done a lot of work on healing-centered engagement and in the trauma-informed classroom. And of course, he says, and I completely agree, that uh, a community that identifies exclusively with our wounds is, uh, is not a good place to be. So we are more than our wounds. You know, we're more than the traumas that have happened to us. And we know that mindfulness is a kind of good medicine. It's a path of healing. So as black people, we can help to, we have to practice. How do we regulate ourselves? How do we feel safe in environments that are not safe? How do we, how do we live in a world when we're stuck in, as I am and was, in hyper arousal? in fight, flight, or freeze mode because the world around me is unsafe? How do I cope with a sense of hypervigilance? How do I live with appeasement emotionally in a dominant culture in order to feel safe? So the research sh shows that for for myself as a black person, um, we have an emotional tax. It's actually called emotional labor that is placed upon us as black people in order to survive in the dominant culture. And the practices, again, from the Plum Village tradition, which have been so healing, are first to become aware become aware of our bodies, become aware of the places where we're holding tension, and to begin to soften that. To begin to calm down the sympathetic nervous system, the autonomic nervous system, and we cannot do it alone. Um, so we need healing spaces. Uh, the so-called affinity spaces where we can do our work, the work of healing, which is iterative and long-term. Um, and needs to be done within the context of community. And then for people who identify as white, I think it's very important that we understand our biography we understand our identity, that we become allies and engage in allyship and understand what that means. And that begins by identifying who we are and where we came from. And that's why we began with identity. It means building emotional stamina. Again, um, Robin D'Angelo speaks about this, Resma Menekin, in his book, um, Grandmother's Hands, speaks about this. And this is our capacity to hold discomfort. And this is the beauty of mindfulness. Mindfulness expands our capacity to be with both difficult emotions and pleasant emotions. So we can root down in that foundation of our own breathing. And again, we can't do this alone. I think it's important that, that whites, that as, as white people, we begin to unpack the invisible knapsack that Peggy McIntosh spoke about, to begin to understand the array of white privilege that is invisible to us as white people. And we know that for whites, that this kind of healing also has to be done within the context of affinity groups to create a space that's safe for healing. So there you have it. These are some thoughts I could keep going, but I won't because I'd like to offer a space for us to be in dialogue about 
what you've heard. I'd like to pause again, and I know that I've said a lot, and there's much more that could be said, but I'd like to just pause for us to just take in this path of healing through mindfulness. So thank you. So now we'll be going into breakout rooms, if you choose. If it doesn't work for you, totally fine. You know, you don't need to do that. Mallory, can I bump in for a second to say that we are scheduled to finish the call at 8.30? Oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so we, people, I've let people know that we might run a little bit over, so they should stay or go, depending on their timing. Do you want to try to do a breakout now or do you want to do question and answer? What, what Let's do question and answers. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry I ran on. No, we loved no, it. it. Nobody <laughs> wanted to get off. No worry. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. So we won't do breakout groups, but yes, let's, um, let's give ourselves just a moment to take it in and, um, yeah, and to hear from, from people who'd like to speak. If you have something you'd like to share, just unmute yourself. We this have, uh, oh sorry, go ahead Marion, I was just going to unmute you. Yeah, this is Marion. Um, when you were describing um, the circumstances of being black, um, what kept coming to mind for me was how many parallels there were to being a woman and uh, sexism. And I kind of feel like when you say whites, to me it's male whites in, in terms of the privilege that you describe that whites enjoy. Just a comment. Thank you. Do we have other people who'd like to offer comments? I appreciate that. Hi, this is Jan. I'd love to um, respond to, sorry. Um, to the comment that was just made and your reference to the invisible knapsack. Um, that was my entry into this whole topic. I'm um, white, 68 years old, and I had no idea and was actually quite resistant to the concept of white privilege or, or anything like that. And then I read The Invisible Knapsack by Peggy McIntosh. And what's interesting to me is her entry point was gender, that um, she came from the entry point of um, women um, not having as much privilege as men. And what I have so much awareness that as a white woman, I still have a ton more privilege than um, a black man or a black woman does. And um, reading Robin DiAngelo and, and just jumping into this, I've really become aware of so much that I, I just had no awareness of it all before. So thank you. You're welcome. Any other thoughts? Thank you. Um, there's no one else with their hand raised at the moment. Anyone else? Mm -hmm. I would like to. Yes, Linda, Linda go ahead. Yeah, yes. go ahead, Linda. And then we have I, Louise and Carla mm -hmm. after that. Mm -hmm. I think I said earlier that I've been working with this for two or three years consciously, but I feel like in the, in the phrases of learning, I feel like I'm at the un, uh, conscious incompetence stage of learning. It's like I'm beginning to, I'm, I don't, I'm not totally unconscious. There's unconscious incompetence, but now I feel like I'm consciously incompetent which 
to me is a big step because I'm starting to notice more and more in my everyday life where these issues come forward. And I'm finding where a few times recently where I've been able to be an ally for something in an organization. And it's, it's like, I haven't read the knapsack, but that's what it feels like. It feels like I'm unpacking all this information that is there that I didn't even know was there. Thank you. So again, thank you so much for this, because this is my spiritual tradition. And I'm so happy to see that Ty, which makes sense that Ty's organization would delve into this. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I recognize that we are at time and that there are people who may wish to leave. So my apologies for going, uh, for going over the time. And if you, if you do need to leave, thank you for being here much gratitude and you know we'll see you another time if those of you who wish can can stay for a few more minutes we'll uh, if we'll close with a, a guided very brief um loving kindness meditation by ruth king valerie are you okay answering two more questions or comments yeah we have two more hands up and then we'll go to the guided maybe um, so we have Louise first. I'm going to unmute you, Louise. I, I just want to uh, name that um, the statement that you just gave, Valerie, was uh, really, uh, I was very aware of the uh, turmoil in my heart as I heard your words, um, yeah. uh, especially um, because you know, I have been making a deep study of this, and I know there's a lot more that you didn't say about the history, and uh, what you did say was so heavy. Uh, I'm feeling it in my body. I'm feeling it in my breath. Um, I, I would be surprised if all of us weren't feeling it a lot in some way or another. And I wanted to just name that and look forward to the meditation by Ruth King. And also to say that um, the, uh, the way this uh, webinar has been orchestrated has really made me happy that we were able to do some talking with each other um, and share quite a bit of sharing to enter this very, um, this space where so many of us need to have deeper and deeper and deeper experiences of this discomfort. I felt supported in that. So thank you very much. Thank you, thank you Louise. And our last comment question will, go, um, will be from Carla. Carla Thomas, I'm gonna unmute you. Thank you so much. Oops. I might have just muted you again. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> hold on. Hold on. Okay, there you go. Louise said some of the things that I, I wanted to say, but I, I felt very deeply um, moved by um, what Valerie said. And, um, you know, on a technical point, I wondered if is it possible for me to experience that again, either by transcript or, or by some kind of recording, because... Um, I feel as though it would be important for me to um, look more deeply into what she said and to and to recognize the way in which it resonated uh, in my body and in my in my mind. I think it's um, it's very powerful, and uh, I would benefit from exposing myself to it again and understanding in more detail what what Valerie said and and also. Um, the other uh, African-American gentleman who spoke, um, what he said also uh, moved me and I, I would like to be able to revisit those if that's possible. And thank you so much for doing this. I found it very valuable. Thank you, Carla. And um, everybody will receive a link. Uh, if you have registered, uh, you will receive an email with the recording of this session. So you will be able to, to, to review and revisit what we have had. And about the other African American uh, person that you, you heard, is Dave Samper, and we will have him uh, in our next session. 
as as the speaker so you will be able also to to hear more from here from him and um, i just want to make a comment because i didn't do, do it at the beginning i am mexican i i identify as a non-white i don't know where i'm exploring exactly where i am but i am definitely not identified as a white thank you So thank you everyone you know clearly we've only touched a tiny bit of this very complex and powerful topic and i'd like to invite us to transition um, so again to feel your feet on the floor to take a few breaths feel the breath come in and feel the breath go out So I'd like to offer these words from Ruth King, a practice of loving kindness, a practice of holding ourselves with a quality of friendship, with a quality of friendliness, with a quality of grace and ease, lightness, even in the midst of all that is happening, to be able to hold all of it with an open heart. May I be safe and protected from harm. May I accept myself as I am. May I recognize that I am complete I'm resourceful, I'm whole, I'm a whole person. May I know that I am loved, I'm lovable. May I be happy. May I be calm and at peace May I be healed. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Val. Thank, thank, thank you. And thank you to everyone who's on the call. Yes. We are really grateful with all of you and just as a reminder we will have our next session with Dave who's here and it's gonna be happening on do you remember the date Annie? March no but it'll be in the email you'll get an email in the email sorry it's March I think it's March 25th I'm almost sure but we, we will have the exact date and um, thank you everybody Yes, thank you. Thank you so much for being on the call. And thank you, Valerie. And thank you, Adriana and Rachel thank for you, your Anna. support on this. Thank you, Annie. Thank Shall you, we Rachel. have a bell? Would you like to ring invite the bell, Adriana? Maybe, Val, do you have your bell? Because <laughs> I do. Thank you, everyone.
Thank you.